please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Lee Shoup. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. TEDx is one of my favorite places to be. I'm really looking forward to hearing the speakers today because I think there's a really great lineup. So my name is Lee Shoup and I'm a professional futurist, so I get paid to think about what's coming next. That's a pretty fun job and I really like it. But I want to tell you a little secret about futurists that you may not know. Futurists don't actually predict the future. Nobody can. As much as we wish that the past went in a straight line through the present to the future, as much as we spend time in corporate boardrooms and our personal lives trying to extrapolate the past into the future, it never works out that way. The future is a big, messy, chaotic, dynamic place. So futurists don't actually predict the future. What we do do is to try to understand the driving forces of change, the things that are propelling the future forward. So we spend a lot of time looking at macro trends and studying macro trends to try to understand the general direction that the future is headed in so we can better understand the opportunities and threats that may be coming further down the road. I've spent a little bit of time working in wearables at Spec Design, so I'm going to be talking about the future of wearables today. But inside this story, I think is a much bigger story about humans and their interrelationship with technology. So we're going to go on a little ride, and we're going to start with, futures being, with wearables being on us, and then in us, and then part of us, and talk about what that means for us as human beings. How many of you guys are wearing an Apple Watch? Okay. How many are wearing a fitness wearable, like a Jawbone or a Fitbit? Okay. Great examples of the current state of the wearables market. Right now, the wearables market is pretty big. It's a $20 billion market, and about 40 million devices will ship in 2015. But we're still really early on, and there's problems with wearables. There's a couple of dirty little secrets about wearables. First, the rate of return is high. It's about 30%. The rate of product abandonment is also high. It's around 50% after six months. So there's a lot of stuff we're still trying to figure out about wearables. What data do people want? How can we generate that data accurately? How can we create a value proposition and an engaging user experience that makes people want to stick with wearables? That being said, the market is opposed for exponential growth. And while a lot of the buzz right now is around health and fitness wearables, and I think that's going to be a really interesting segment of the market, I think the market's going to be much bigger than that. I think we're going to see wearables used in fashion to express identity, emotion, social status, and connectedness. I think we're going to see wearables become part of our bodies as we augment and extend our human capabilities. I think that we're going to see wearables used to extend our senses and the information we can gather from the world. And I think we're going to see wearables as extensions of our brains to increase our cognition and abilities to perceive. Let's look at the macro trends that are really driving this market. I'll take you around my little Da Vinci's wheel that I made up. This really starts with the growth of the cloud and with our mobile devices being able to connect massive computing power almost anytime and anywhere. Next is nanotechnology, which is really technology at the molecular level. Then comes artificial intelligence as our algorithms get smarter and smarter and get better predictive capabilities. Next is increasing computing power as we continue to ride Moore's Law. Biocomputing, the interfaces of biology and computing interfaces, which is really important for the future of wearables. Miniaturization, everything continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And big data, data is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're learning a lot more as we get these huge data sets from data that we've never had access to before. And sensors being everywhere. And this is really a story of sensors. So think of sensors like you think of grains of sand. They're going to be everywhere, all around us, in our wearables and in our environments. And we're starting to think of these environments as ambient environments. The cost of sensors is dropping dramatically. And soon we'll see a lot of sensors that are available for only a few pennies apiece. Because sensors are getting so inexpensive, we're now starting to advise some of our clients that are doing high-end products to include sensors in the products, even if we don't know what they're going to do with the data yet. Because it's so inexpensive to gather the data that you can look for value once you have the data and start analyzing it and looking for patterns, but you don't want to miss that opportunity. 
Sensors are becoming increasingly smart, connected, and predictive. Right now, most of the sensors we carry are in our smartphones. We're going to see sensors leave the centralized device of our smartphone and start to be distributed all over our bodies, all in the networks around us, increasingly being smart and predictive networks that inter are interacting with each other. Let's take a quick ride kind of through the history of wearables and where I think wearables are going. So wearables start, started off as tech toys. Do we have any Minecraft players in the audience? <laughs> ah, okay. This is the game band which Spec Design developed for Minecraft. And what it enables Minecraft players to do is to take their Minecraft world with them in a USB drive. And it also has a calendar and an LED display that you can personalize. What's interesting about this is this is a physical artifact from a virtual world. And more and more, we're going to see these worlds start to intermingle. Do you guys know where Taylor Swift is right now? <laughs> I bet you didn't think I was going to ask you that. <laughs> Taylor Swift is singing in Singapore tonight. And every person that goes to a Taylor Swift concert gets one of these translucent silicon bracelets. What's cool about these bracelets is that they do not have an on and an off switch. They come to life as the concert starts, and they sync with the music and the light show, and even with other members of the audience. They change colors and can swim and shimmy to reflect the mood and the music. So this is an example of a wearable creating a, a cool shared social experience. This is a ring called the Aura Ring that I first saw at a quantified self-conference in San Francisco. It's a really cool ceramic ring. What it does is it can gather data to help people better predict their sleep patterns as well as their activity levels during the day. And what was interesting about this to me is that we're now starting to see sensors come into fashion accessories and even jewelry, stuff that wasn't smart before, is now becoming smart and allowing us all kinds of new possibilities to learn about ourselves. This is a Ralph Lauren smart shirt that was first worn by the Ball Boys at the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament this year. It has sensors distributed throughout the shirt that measure breathing and breathing rates, heart rates, uh, maximum athletic push, and a variety of data, and it can give a readout after a workout to let you know how well you did and how much you pushed your boundaries. What's interesting about this is this, with the sensors spread out across a garment, they can gather better and more accurate data than you can from most wristbands. This is a company in London called Cute Circuit that's doing smart clothing. And I talked about fashion sort of expressing identity and emotion, and they're doing a really good job of this. They developed something called a hug shirt, which allows you to hug someone from long distance and feel a hug in your clothing. <laughs> is anybody feeling my hug now? <laughs> they've also done a fashion dress for Katy Perry, and they've done some stage gear for U2. And they've done a Twitter dress that reflects tweets in real time. So again, really interesting ways that sensors are being used to express fashion and emotion and other things that humans would like to do besides just measure their, their biological levels. This is a contact lens for a company called Innovega, and it works, in, it works in tandem with glasses. So if you're familiar with Google Glasses, you know that Google Glasses allow you to see data on the periphery of the glasses, so you can engage with the real world and have kind of data on the side. What these contact lenses allow you to do is to project a full virtual world onto the contact lenses from the glasses. So you have a fully immersive experience, a lot like an Oculus Rift. So the next time you're in a meeting and you see someone staring off into space, <laughs> they may actually be in a whole different virtual world. I only wish I had this for some of my meetings. Another thing that we're seeing wearables do is become extensions of our bodies. So this is, is Amy Mullen, who's an athlete and has set several records for track and field, and Oscar Pistorius, who you've probably heard of, the South African track and field star. What's interesting is that they, they needed legs, and instead of just getting legs that imitated human legs, they shopped a lot more widely. These legs are actually modeled on the legs of a cheetah, and these runners have done so well with these legs that a lot of runners with normal legs complained that they were getting a technological advantage. So this is really interesting to me because our mindset is changing, where where previously we thought of this as a deficiency and we just wanted to replace something missing with a human part, now we're looking at it as an opportunity to augment and have something that's cooler or better than human parts that we were born with. 
Amy has nine pairs of legs that have been custom designed for her, and she no longer worries about them looking human. They can look however she wants them to look. And I love that feeling of freedom and exploration that she has. This is a shower cap that's fitted with devices to read your brain waves. And don't worry, you're not going to have to wear this. They're already getting a lot smaller and lighter and cheaper. You can find some made by a company in San Francisco called Neurosky on Amazon.com, and you can do a lot of parlor tricks using your brainwaves now. You can balance a ball, you can fly a helicopter. Some of my colleagues have been flying the helicopter and have had some pretty good success. On a more serious side, there's a lot of work now being done with paraplegics, learning how to focus their brainwaves to help them do things like move a mouse on a computer screen or be able to navigate a wheelchair. And so there's a lot of cutting edge stuff happening here in neuroscience that I think is going to have more mainstream market applications. And I think we'll hear a little more about that later today. This is an ingestible sensor from a company called Proteus. It's based in Redwood City. I've worked with them for the last couple of years. The, there's a pill that you take as a sensor that actually transmit, that transmits data from your stomach to a patch as a receiver that's worn on your abdomen that then takes the data to a smartphone or a computer where you can share your health data with your doctor. This is just kind of the precursor of the sensors that we're going to see coming into our bodies. Very soon, we're going to be able to have sensors in our bloodstream measuring our blood composition, in our gut measuring our digestion, in our brains measuring our brain waves, and there, it's, there are going to be sensors all within our bodies giving us information that we've never had before. So what does this mean as sensors go from on us to in us to part of us? What are the opportunities and what are the risks? Well, the opportunities are we all get to be a little superhuman. And I don't know about you, but I would like to be a little superhuman. There's a lot of times my brain comes up with ideas that my body isn't really sure about. <laughs> and I'd like to get them on the same page. So some of the things that I think we'll see are, I think we'll learn a lot more about our bodies and a lot more about our health and how our bodies uniquely work. And I think that's probably going to extend human lifespan. I think the quality of our lives will also improve as we learn what we need to do to be healthy and we get a lot better and faster feedback about the things we do that are healthy or are not healthy. I think we'll see a lot of new possibilities come out that we can only dream of today. So what are the risks? Every Superman has his kryptonite, right? I don't worry about the risk from machines as much as I worry about the risk from humans. I think there's three areas we need to pay attention to. The first is this is really uncharted territory, and we don't know how our bodies are going to react to sensors. We'll probably, make, we'll probably figure it out, but we'll probably make some mistakes along the way. So having some caution is probably prudent. Second is our privacy. We're going to be generating more and more personal data about ourselves, and we're going to really need to think hard about who owns that data, who controls that data, and who has access to the data, because the data is truly going to be up close and personal. Third is security. Right now, there's very little security around wearable devices. As become, they become more important to us and more tied in with our health and well-being, we'll need to think about how we secure these systems. Having your email hacked is nothing compared to having your body hacked. So what should we be thinking about? So at privacy, think about who owns your data, because you're already giving up a whole lot of your data to corporations that own it, that you're generating. Think about security, because as the data becomes more important and more personal, making it secure is going to become increasingly important. And the third is thinking about what it means to be human in this new world. In the futures community, there's three camps right now. There's a camp that says we're just going to be humans with better tech toys. There's a camp that says it will be surpassed by artificial intelligence and that a coming singularity will mean the machines are so much smarter than us that they become the dominant force on the planet. And there's a middle group called the transhumanists who believe that humans will combine with machines and bionic parts to become something that is post-human. So here's some stuff to think about. I said that I couldn't predict the future, but here's three possible ways that it could go for some brain food to start your day. Thank you very much.